Afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come uh, visit uh, with you. Uh, my name is Mike Smith. I'm a distinguished lecturer for 2005-2006. And I want to acknowledge and say thank you to the uh, SPE and the SPE Foundation uh, for making this possible. I also want to say thank you to you. Uh, we, the lecturers, are fully aware that you vote to select who you want to come visit. And so I take it as quite a compliment that you selected me. And I hope it will be, be worth your while. What we'd like to talk about today is hydraulic fracturing, naturally. That's what I do. But hopefully some aspects of hydraulic fracturing that don't get as much attention, maybe, as other parts of the technology. And I thought I'd talk, start, look at hydraulic fracturing as the multidisciplinary subject. We note that fracturing began in 1947, and the word multidisciplinary does not even appear in the SPE literature until 1985, and then about 10 years ago it became popular. However, fracturing involves geology and geophysics, reservoir engineering, we are trying to alter the fluid flow in the reservoir. What could be more reservoir engineering function than that? Uh, operations, obviously, has historically ruled fracturing. Rock mechanics, how does the fracture grow? Fluid mechanics, chemistry of the materials, petrophysics to determine our input parameters from logs, uh, and we could probably think of a few more. We have to use every discipline in the oil industry in order to completely design a hydraulic fracture treatment. So we want to try to look today at some aspects of this that sometimes don't get the attention they might deserve, and in particular look at the consequences of maybe not paying attention to those. Well, last year, Usman Ahmed gave a lecture on fracturing, and he began, he held up his hand and said, there's only five things you need to know about fracturing. You need to know permeability, saturations, reservoir pressure, mechanical property, and the in-situ stresses. And that's a pretty good list. But I'm here today to tell you, get out your other hand. How about drainage boundaries? Stress directions. Do you think about stress directions? Thermodynamic heat transfer properties of the rocks. Geologic structure has a tremendous influence on fracturing. And I feel certain we could come up with a few more and take our shoes off. And what we're going to do is look at some of these today. And I tried to come up with a comparison to start the talk. And naturally, I thought of the old blind man and the elephant. And that's not bad for fracturing. But I thought today, uh, fracturing is much like a jigsaw puzzle. If we look at all the pieces, each piece is pretty simple. So long as we ignore highly naturally fractured reservoirs and deviated wells stupidly drilled in the wrong direction, each piece of fracturing is very simple. But there sure are a lot of pieces. Well, fortunately, the more pieces we can assemble, the better picture we see. I don't believe we can recognize anything here. This frack will probably fail. But let's just get a few more pieces. Uh, does anybody recognize the picture now? Looks like a leopard. Great. A frack hand. We can, do, we can recognize the picture without all the pieces. And fracturing will work without all the pieces. But we get to the end of the talk and we'll see just how good an answer that was. Well, fracturing works without all the pieces. And this is a picture of the first frack in Hugoton Gas Field in Kansas, 1947. And fracturing became the standard completion for that field. Fracturing worked. They knew very little about it. But they were brave enough to step off into the unknown. So 40 years later, Kansas Corporation Commission ruled we should infill at a second well for every square mile. 40 years of technology, we certainly must have done much better. Right? Guess again. We look at the absolute open flow potential of the new well, 
compared to the absolute open flow potential of its 40-year-old offset, the new wells were no better and no worse than the 40-year-old well. With the exception of three operators, Union Pacific, whom I know nothing about, Arco in a different color, only because I knew I know a little bit about what they did. Others were some very small oil companies that hired Arco engineers. What they did was go gather a few more pieces of the puzzle and it doubled the results of fracturing. Did fracturing work for all the other operators? Yes. It worked in 1990 just as well as it worked in 1950. But with more pieces of the puzzle, we can do better. Well, ideally, how should this work? Our reservoir engineering should set our goals. Here is the fracture we want. Let's just uh, call something fracturing then. Answers, can I achieve those goals? Or how do I achieve those goals? Drilling and operations only function then is to set limits. You need to achieve those goals within these limits, not the historic role of dominating fracturing. And that's ideally how it should work. So let's sort of talk about it in that context. And we'll start with our reservoir engineering aspects of fracturing. Two primary things of interest we would find is permeability, as Usman mentioned, and drainage boundaries. Well, recently I attended an advanced technology workshop in Corpus Christi. Someone got up on the stage and said, knowing permeability would not have impacted fracture design. I found that an astounding statement in the year 2005. Let's examine that a little bit. Here's a case, 15 wells covering several fields, all 10,000 feet deep, hard rock, gas wells. Uh, 0.3 to 3 millidarcy permeability. Five of the 15 wells had a prefract flow, so we knew something about the reservoir. Three of those five had a pressure buildup test, so we knew permeability. Uh, all 15 frac treatments were preceded with prefract testing. All 15 treatments were pumped as planned. The final shut-in pressure was as expected. We did everything we could to ensure we achieved our design goals. But our real goal is production. We predicted a post-frac rate of 82 million cubic feet of gas per day. Actual was about 40. We didn't do very good, did we? Any of you ever had fracturing experiences like that? Obviously, fracture length is much shorter than the fracture models say. But let's examine that. The five wells where we had a prefrac flow flowed a cumulative of about 4 million cubic feet a day. post frac were predicted to be about 21 an actual post frac was around 20. We pretty well achieved our goals. Let's break it down a little further. The three wells where we knew permeability, the actual and the predicted were identical. That says if I know permeability, I can achieve my goal. But look at that. That says 20% of the wells made 40% of the gas. Is that coincidence? So a little study was done, not a rigorous, multivariable, super-duper optimization, but just a quick study. What if I kept the total volume of propent the same? Clearly this well had higher permeability than I expected. So I need a shorter, smaller, fatter frac. This well, permeability was much lower than I expected. I needed a much bigger frac. Just redistribute it. That quick study said those 15 wells had the potential to make 62 million cubic feet a day just by redistributing this amount of profit. So that was the prize from knowing permeability was a 50% improvement in our fracturing effectiveness. Not bad, not bad. Not the two times we saw in Hugoton, but not bad. So if you do not know permeability, don't blame the fracture models for your lack of success. <coughs> Drainage boundaries. I picked up this comment out of the 
technical interest discussion on the internet. Who out there today takes the time and spends the money to properly characterize multiple pay intervals of unknown drainage areas during an active drilling campaign? That's a pretty fair question, I think. Do we really do that? Well, if we're not doing that, why are you here today? Not that I'm encouraging you to get up and leave. What is the impact of that? And let's take one quick example. Water fracks were reintroduced in the Cotton Valley a few years ago uh, to great success. One thing in that success that went unnoticed, though, is at the same time we were infill drilling uh, down to 80 acres and even 40 acres. The original development of that formation is expected it would be developed on 640 acres and the ideal fracture length was 2,000 feet. We cannot transport sand 2,000 feet with water. But at 80 acres or even 40 acres, the ideal fracture length is down to about 500 feet. And I might well be able to carry sand 500 feet with water with sufficient pump rate. So one factor that made the water fracks a success was simply drainage boundaries. Drainage boundaries were closer. I no longer needed this long, long fracture. <laughs> well, what about just one drainage boundary? Here's a case, bottom hole well location here. We knew, in a theoretical sense, that this fault was right there. That is, the G and G people knew it was there. We had been told it was there. But we designed a frack and ignored it. And we expected our frack to come in at about 8 million cubic feet of gas a day, decline quickly, and kind of stabilize around 3. Instead, it fell off the table down to about 1 million a day very quickly. Very disappointing. What does it mean? It means that we designed way too much frack. There was only half the reservoir we thought. We only needed half the frack job that we pumped. I can Nothing I could do would improve that well. However, I could have saved a lot of money. <coughs> One, a single drainage boundary. Well, what about a real reservoir? Things are more complicated. And here's a pictorial put together by uh, someone at BP who's much, much better at PowerPoint than I'll ever be. And we're looking at a braided stream development, as the geologists would say. Over geologic time, all these little rivers are running through there, depositing sand. Finally, I get a nice marine deltaic sequence. And I drill a well through this whole mess and put a big frack in it. Now tell me, what is the drainage area for this well? We have no idea. And there's no way to have any idea. So do we just give up? Reservoir engineers these days routinely use geostatistics in their work. So why can't we do that in fracturing? And that's the approach this company took. They said, well, I know I have a distribution of pay thickness from my petrophysics. And I have a distribution of permeability derived from post frac production decline analysis. Showing that, you know, most of my wells are five microdarcies, but a fourth of them are a little better than that. Ten percent of them are pretty good, and then there's a sprinkling of the barn burner wells out there. <laughs> Is this data any good? Well, additional testing was done using very small volume injection test, a new, very exciting technology. And it was very encouraging that it gave pretty much the same distribution of permeabilities. Mostly five microdarcies, some a little better than that, and then a sprinkling of very good wells. So we know statistically what our formation thickness is, what our permeability is, and our drainage area. And we find quite a few of the wells with small drainage areas, as expected. But it turned out well over half the wells had significant drainage areas. And that was a bit of a surprise because they had been designing their fracks based on 30-acre drainage for every well. 
So what's the right answer? I'm not going to get into their final answer, but they just approached it statistically. So we cannot know in advance what the drainage area is, what the permeability is, but we can treat this statistically. And should I do little bitty fracks and save money? Should I do big fracks for the occasional barn burner well? What should I do? And they used geostatistics to design their fracks and had a large impact on their program. So we can do something even in a real geology. <clears throat> Basically, drainage boundaries trump fracture length and conductivity. Let's say I've been doing some little fracks, 200 feet long, making a certain production, and somebody convinces me you need to do a big frack and you can triple your production up here. And so we do, and it doesn't triple my production. It only increases at about 20%. I'm very disappointed. So if I look at the three black curves here, a good salesman comes by and he says, the problem is you did not achieve this high conductivity that you designed for because you used an inferior profit. And you're down here on this bottom black curve. If you had used my product, you could be up here. And he could well be right. But it could also be drainage boundaries. And we cannot distinguish the difference between poor conductivity and drainage boundaries. Drainage boundaries trump fracture length and conductivity. So they are a major thing that is often ignored in our designs. <laughs> so if you haven't talked to the G&G &G folks, don't blame the fracture models when your results are half what you expected. Well, next, fracturing. Fracturing involves rock mechanics, thermodynamics, uh, and let's talk about rock mechanics, and let's talk about the other horizontal stress. We're all familiar with the minimum horizontal stress, the fracture closure pressure, and our fractures open up perpendicular to that stress. But what about this other horizontal stress parallel to the fracture? How often do you pay any attention to that? And does it have any effect? Do we need to worry about it? What about this? And let's just look at a case. Looking down on a well bore for a case where the other horizontal stress is very big. The effect of that is to try to mash the well bore down into an ellipse. The process of that, it puts the well bore in tension. Make this stress big enough and the well bore fractures. For example, if I run an image log in East Texas, I will find that the well is hydraulically fractured from top to bottom during the drilling process. Just the creation of the hole, the well fractures. So what? Is that a problem? Well, let's look at a typical completion problem that we often face today. I've got about 200 feet of pay uniformly spread over 800 feet of rock. I've got little zone there, little zone there at the bottom, little zone there, uh, kind of a thick zone there, some little zones up here. How am I going to complete this? Do I need to do one, two, three, four, five fracks? Uh, two, one, two, one. What do I do? A big part of that is breakdown. If I have a big high breakdown pressure and I try to treat this whole interval and this zone breaks first, it's going to be very difficult to ever frack these other intervals. But in East Texas, you don't need to worry about that because the well is already fractured by your friendly drillers. So there is no breakdown pressure. And here we see an example for this well. Actually, they got a little greedy. There's two more sets of perforations down here where there is no production. So they got a little greedy. But you see, they treated one, two, three, four, five intervals 
tracer, production, we can successfully treat multiple intervals because the well is already broken down. That's not part of our problem because of this other stress. Well, let's move south. <laughs> what if these stresses are about the same size? effect of that is just to compress the well bore. And we get very high compressive stresses around the well bore, a stress cage. Well, if my fracture then initiates, gets outside of these high stresses, it is never coming back to the well bore, ever. It'll stop, it'll turn a corner, it'll go around a circle, it will never come back into this high stress region. So what? Well, let's look at an example, courtesy of Chevron. They've got about a 350-foot section of sand here. Their typical completion would be to perforate there, 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 everywhere the resistivity is high. And then they would pump a large frack with five or six sets of perforated intervals, just like we just saw in the East Texas case. Did eight wells on a lease on the... One of those wells, they perforated a single 10-foot section here at the bottom and pumped the same frack. That well was, by a significant margin, the best well of the eight. But the tracer log shows the fracture only covered about 50 feet of this 350-foot zone. Later operations showed absolutely that this sand up here was depleted. In this case, the rather equal stresses created a situation where you were much better off to have a single perforated interval and let the fracture grow up. Where in the East Texas case, quite different because of the difference in the other horizontal stress. What about effective stress? Effective stress is defined as the weight of the overburden minus reservoir pressure. Does that have any effect? Well, there's an idea, it's an old idea, that what if a fracture comes up to a bedding plane and just slips open? It will stop growing right there. Perfect height confinement. Beautiful. If we could create this, man, that'd be, that'd be a deal. Or it might come up and branch to the left and branch to the right and just get lost in a very complex pattern. Either way, there has to be some slippage along these bedding planes. Well, okay, so what? <clears throat> this slippage would be related to the effective stress, the weight of the overburden minus the reservoir pressure. If that is high, high vertical stresses acting on these bedding planes, they will not slip. And we can put numbers to that. Could it happen? Certainly. Here's a case in the Atoka Shale. Depth of around 1,800 feet. There's my injection interval, just a massive shale. And yet, not all of the data, but much of the data suggest a very one-sided fracture growth for some reason. Why didn't the fracture grow up? Mind you, some data suggests it did, but let's say it didn't. If it didn't grow up, why not? Possibly some slippage in this relatively shallow, overpressured formation. And here's some laboratory work that basically came up with a very simple solution. If the net overburden stress is greater than the tensile stress of the rock, then what's easier? It's easier to crack that rock and just go right across the interface. If the tensile strength of the rock is greater than the net overburden stress, then it's easier to slip than it is to crack that rock. Very simple relation. If you're over here, you're not going to slip. You're going to go right through. If you're over here, you may slip. But this is Tennessee sandstone. That is about as high tensile strength as you're ever going to get in a rock. That says we are looking at shallow, low effective stress situations where this can happen. 
So then if we go to the Cotton Valley formation at 10,000 feet with an effective stress of 5,000 PSI, it's not fair to say, well, slippage could control fracture height growth because that would require a rock with a tensile strength greater than 5,000 PSI, and that animal does not exist. So we can put numbers to these things. It does not have to be arm-waving. Another common thing we talk about are multiple fractures. And I pull this out of the online technical discussion. Uh, I'll let you read it because it's difficult to read. But he's discussing multiple parallel fractures. Is this possible? It's commonly postulated to explain problems. But let's examine this. Two types of multiple fractures. I could have what has been termed segmented fractures. This fracture, and then this fracture, and then this fracture, and this fracture. And people say, well, you've got four. So your pressures will be four times higher. Turns out that's not true. Let's take an extreme case where we have 19. The simple solution says, well, a single fracture pressure would be here. Uh, if I had 19 fractures, the simple solution says, well, the pressure is going to be up here about 19 times greater. The actual fact is 19 fractures gives us about a 10% increase in pressure. That's all. Is this possible? Certainly. Absolutely. It would actually be a very ideal fracture situation for propent transport if we could create that on purpose. But it does not affect our pressure. Physics. The other common postulate of fracturing is I have multiple parallel fractures, which causes me problems. Well, here's a mathematical solution, and what you'll find is you can have two. That surprised me. I thought the answer would be one. You could only have one. Turns out two is stable, but there is no pressure that will open that middle fracture. And there are actually geologic analogs to this. Uh, apologize for the picture. But what it's a picture of are a dike. A dike is an underground blowout from a volcano. A hydraulic fracture propagated with molten rock. What they find is these run in pairs and they run straight as an arrow for miles and miles and miles and miles. There are other cracks in between them, but there will never be any lava in those cracks. Only two. So when somebody talks about seven fractures, or in one SPE paper, seven and a half fractures, I've often wondered what a half a fracture looks like. There can only be two physics. And here we see some lab experiments and numerical modeling and we see that there is no pressure that will open these interior fractures. None. What about the <coughs> thermodynamic properties of the rock? Is that something we need to worry about? Again, I picked up uh, something out of the TIG. Conventional wisdom. Now, there is a dangerous term right there. <laughs> you already know to, to read this carefully was the frac fluid had very little cooling effect on the formation, and what little effects there were was quickly dissipated. During the treatment, the fluid experienced a rapid rise in temperature as it turns the corner and enters the fracture. As a result, bottom hole static temperature could be used for designing fluid systems and breakers. Is that correct? It's what we do, but is it correct? So we did a numerical simulation... And we found for a uh, Bossier sand tight gas case, if we looked at the temperature distribution in the fracture right at shut-in, 90% of the fluid was either at or very near bottom hole static temperature, as you can see by, oh, say, back to here. Only a small region near the well was cool. So conventional wisdom was 90% accurate. That's uh, pretty good for fracturing. But let's uh, move a little bit to the east here, to a uh, deep water offshore well. And now we pumped our mini frac, 
and we look at the temperature distribution and because of the high fluid loss, we find that the entire fracture is cooled down. It's not only cooled down, it is cold because that frac fluid hits the seabed at about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So what? So we missed it. Are we going to pay a consequence? Obviously, or we would not be using it as an example. Here's what the design called for. A tip screen out with a net pressure increase of about 500 PSI to create a wide fracture. Let's see what happened. Here they pumped their mini frac. We can see the bottom hole temperature in the well bore cools off from uh, 220 down to about 100 and it just stays there. And we start pumping and we pump our frack and pressure goes down and down and down and we have an accidental shut in at the surface. <clears throat> so we shut in for 10 minutes and we start pumping again with no problems in a well that is projected to make 30,000 barrels of oil a day. Mind you, this is not tight gas. Pressure goes down and down and down, and finally the job's over. No tip screen out, no pressure increase. Post frac scan of 22, three weeks later, a sand control failure. Whoops. This mini frac fluid is still in the formation and is still 100% cross -linked. They use massive quantities of breaker in their mini frac fluid, every bit of it high temperature breaker for the bottom hole static temperature of 230 degrees. But that fluid was at 110 degrees. Thermodynamic properties have effects. Mathematics and modeling, just something we should worry about. I mean, we're frac dogs. Again, a comment, a significant disconnect between what wells should be producing based on the 3D model predicted prop length. But, of course, he didn't really mean 3D model, did he? He meant pseudo-3D model, the standard tool in the industry since 1981, 25 years. Again, what are the consequences? So we looked at a case, back to South Texas tight gas again, and we see a very steep stress gradient through the Vicksburg and the Wilcox. Several shale stress tests in here. It's just 0.95 PSI per foot straight through everything. Think about the consequences of that. That says the fracture grows up 100 feet. It's 100 PSI easier to frack. If it can grow up another 100 feet, it's now 200 PSI easier to frack. Pretty soon that's going to run away from us. So we looked at this case. We're perforating the bottom lobe of this sand here, a la the Chevron procedure. And we looked at two pseudo 3D models. And the first predicted a fracture length of about 350 feet. Uh, the other about 400 feet, plus or minus 10 or 20 percent. Quite acceptable for fracturing. There's actually more difference in the two models than that, but still not bad. Now let's look at two 3D models. And we see this model says about 250 feet, about half what the pseudo 3D model said, and this model says about 250 feet. Pseudo 3D models are based on approximations. They can and do give drastic different answers. 3D models were back to solving equations, and we get the same answer. And that answer says the frack is half as long as you think it is, just as the comment in the TIG noted. Production is much less than expected. Okay, well, let's look at a little movie and see what's happening here. And we see that initially the fracture is radial. But then as it grows in height, it gets easier to propagate at the top, so it grows faster. And as it grows more height, it gets even easier to fracture at the top. So pretty soon it is running away from us. And what we see at the end 
is irregardless of how much we pump, we can create about 200 feet of fracture length. Again, about half what was expected. <coughs> Again, a different behavior because of a different model, a real model. Is this truth? We don't know. We do know we added perforations in this zone later. We got no extra production. We did gather a little bit of extra fracture fluid. We added perforations in this little zone and got no extra production. Clearly, both of these intervals were being drained by the fracture. We added perforations in this zone and got no extra production. Unfortunately, it's not totally clear that that zone would have been productive. The porosity is a little on the low side. So certainly fracture grew up 200 plus feet and was able to drain the fracture down. So I'll put a question to you. If we do not believe our current pseudo 3D models and we are not willing to change to more rigorous tools, then why don't we quit using them? So I looked up the definition of pseudo in the American Heritage Dictionary and was quite surprised to find that the definition is fake, counterfeit, false. Not quite what I expected, but I think maybe pretty apt. Finally, geophysics. Even geophysics has a role to play in fracturing. This is a case from uh, western Oklahoma. We are pumping a mini-frac. No problem. I, I say we. This is given to me. I had nothing to do with this fiasco. And we are pumping our gel down to the perfs at a low rate. Gel's on the perfs, so we bring the rate up. We're pumping along at 20 barrels a minute. Surface pressure of 12,000 PSI or something. Everything's looking good. And all of a sudden, pop up. It's all over. Pressure spiked up there to... Uh, 16,000 PSI, rate went to zero, and we never pumped into the well again. So the first item of discussion was exactly why did the pressure go 2,000 PSI above our maximum pressure? We were specified maximum pressure was 14, service company. What are you doing to me here? The next item of discussion was why did you pump propent in my mini frac? Something had to cause this screen out. And it's just a mystery. So the next day they ran in the well with a wire line. And lo and behold, about a thousand feet above the perforations, the well was gone. There was no well. Mystery. And then someone heard about a drilling rig a few miles away that twisted off that day. Finally, someone thought to call the University of Oklahoma and say, what is going on here? Turned out there was a magnitude 2.9 earthquake about three miles away and several thousand feet deeper than the location of this well. So if nothing else today, I have given you a fabulous excuse for the next time you have problems on a frack job. Operations, uh, I've not been keeping track, but I think we're out of time. I uh, appreciate your time, your interest. Uh, and let's see how well we did with the first picture. It was a baby leopard. You were almost right, but you needed more pieces to get the total truth. Again, thank you very much.